So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then uh, once I go through uh, about half of the talk, Jessica is going to take over, and she'll introduce herself and give you a little bit of background on, on herself. Um, so I'm a general internist by training. Uh, I'm a physician who trained here for medical school in the 80s, did my residency here in the 90s, uh, spent a small time in Colorado, and then came back. And so I've been back since 2001. And, um, and I, I, got in, I, I got into innovation uh, uh, primarily by way of doing research in quality improvement and implementation science. And it was in that work that uh, uh, when we found that we were really yearning for something more disruptive and breakthrough in the improvement work that we were trying to do, that we realized that we needed to start thinking out of the box. And that the best way to do that is to bring in people who aren't in your box. And so we'd bring in medical anthropologists and engineers uh, and people from different disciplines and, um, and had them look at the problem from a totally different perspective. Uh, and we learned a lot. And, I, and so over time, I, I transitioned from the research side to the delivery system side. And so in, in, the, in my role as chief innovation officer, I'm, I oversee our continuous improvement department and our lean uh, department uh, in, in a dyad role with our chief of staff. And so I still am very uh, 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 focused on, under, on improving the, the basic structure of healthcare service and delivery. Uh, and it's only once you sort of remove the noise from the system that you then have opportunities to, see, to allow innovation to emerge. Uh, and so uh, many times people hear about innovation officers and there are people who are identifying the latest startup to take the market and uh, make the best bet. Uh, we still try to do a little bit of that, but we start with the problem first. And so I think that's really uh, some of the key points if I start with the main messages at the beginning uh, about the way that we approach innovation through our clinical innovation center is that we don't start with the solution. We start with the problem because uh, there's a lot of people out south of market and in the Silicon Valley who have lots of solutions they wanna sell you and they're looking for a problem. And sometimes they hit gold, most of the time they don't. And a lot of times you still have to adapt and tailor that thing to work in your system. And so our approach is really to start with the problem first. Uh, and number two is to look at the problem from the patient perspective and, and engage the patient voice in how you uh, design strategies and solutions. And we do that from a service design model. And, and that's important because, you know, the context of healthcare delivery, whether it's at home, in the community, or in the hospital, is much more, uh, much more complex than just the one innovation or the one widget that you're trying to fit into that system. And so an appreciation for the system and, and the social context in which you work is also key. And the third, I said earlier, is, is uh, multidisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary teams. And so, Jessica, when she introduces herself, will let you know about her pharmacy background, her business background, her startup background, uh, and even just generational background. Uh, I think uh, she's in a, the early age group where uh, I, I don't think uh, there was a time when did, there was a non-digital time. I mean, it's always been digital. And so, uh, whereas for people like me, I had a big period of time where it was much more uh, uh, written and, and the digital thing was new. And so I just don't think digitally from the beginning, but Jessica does. And uh, it's, it, that's one way that the perspective helps a lot. So enough of my rambling. That's just a little bit of an introduction. Um, and uh, I, I kind of have, have a tendency to want to roam out there, and, but I'm going to stay back right here and face the camera and stay on light, stay on message. So our Clinical Innovation Center team um, consists of uh, uh, these uh, seven individuals right now, um, and we have a, quite a few other partners that come in, but I thought I'd begin by talking about the team because uh, it's really that, that interdisciplinary uh, approach that helps. So Jessica is our director. We have a Christy Biscarden, who's a behavioral scientist and social scientist uh, who uh, contributes uh, to our brainstorming and our ideation. Uh, our, our fundamental model is service design, and so we have Jan Yeager, who's a service designer with uh, 20 to 30, well, 15 years of experience, uh, mostly outside of healthcare, and then has, uh, over the last five years, transitioned into healthcare. Um, we have other uh, service designer, uh, a graduate from uh, Carnegie Mellon, who focuses a little bit more on graphic and visual design, and so even within the design area, you have 
specialization. And then we have project managers, Anke and Amy uh, uh, Williams, who um, are amazing project managers, but they also bring in other perspectives. And so Anke has a clinical informatics background and had a, has a master's in that area. Um, Amy uh, has an education background. Um, and so all of these perspectives really matter. And if you read some of the books like The Medici Effect, what, what really catalyzed the Renaissance was uh, the Medici family paying to bring in these people from outside of, of, of Florence to sort of bring in new perspectives and new ways of thinking. And that's really what, what allowed people to get out of the box. And this isn't quite the same as the Medici uh, or, the, or the group that was in Florence, but it, it's still uh, the beginning, the core of how we think differently. We have uh, lots of other people we partner with, but like I said, this is the core. Where we're positioned in, at UCSF, the Clinical Innovation Center, uh, represented by the CIC, is that we straddle the medical center health system and the schools of medicine and the health professional schools. And so we try to meet needs on both sides. On the health care delivery side, on the medical center side, we focus on helping to improve service, performance, and outcomes, uh, uh, particularly across what we call our True North metrics as a lean organization. Uh, the hospital has a set of priorities uh, in quality and safety, in patient experience, in engage, uh, provider and staff engagement, financial health. Uh, and so we tune into those priorities and uh, we partner with some of the uh, units and teams to help them improve. Um, and on the campus side or the health professional school side, it's really about research and training. Uh, and we provide opportunities uh, for uh, fellows and students to work with us. And we've starting to develop curricula. We just were in the, pro in the, in the middle of uh, completing a human-centered design course uh, for our master's program. Um, uh, and so at the end, uh, what we hope we achieve uh, through this process is that we can help UCSF ach Health achieve its goals of being the best uh, place to get care at the lowest cost and the best place to work. Um, and on the campus side, it's uh, about research, monetization, and dissemination of the intellectual products that come out of the amazing faculty and researchers that we have at UCSF. And so the way we do this is uh, we develop platforms to create a diverse and open environment uh, for people to think differently. Um, and so on the left, we, you have the people that are, that are in our uh, clinical innovation center. And then we form partnerships with a variety of groups uh, that begin with the first two that I mentioned, UCSF Health and the professional schools, but we also have uh, great relationships with a variety of groups at Berkeley where we can bring in uh, students or faculty who have an interest in a certain area that we're working in or a parallel interest, and we have them join our project teams. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of what comes out of that. Um, industry is a key partner, and there, a lot of times, if we just let industry work on their own, they don't get the, the the delivery system perspective that's necessary for their products to be most effective. Uh, and so we think that there's a, there's a right way to partner with industry to achieve each other's goals. Uh, and we also work with accelerators and startups. There's a lot of those around the Bay Area. Um, it hasn't been as fruitful as we thought it would be, uh, in part because a lot of the groups that get in there have already uh, gotten their what they call their minimum viable product, their MVP, and they, they're looking for uh, funding and, and, and an exit strategy. And they're not interested in co-developing and modifying what they've developed. And so uh, it doesn't work as well for us because most of the time you take these early innovations off the shelf and they don't work. And you need to be able to adapt, learn, modify, and fine tune them to your environment. Um, and, so, uh, and so with industry actually, they are more interested in co-development partly because they have a longer view of investment and, uh, and deeper resources. Um, now, how do we get these people together? We need platforms, uh, which is another word uh, uh, that, to represent funding. And uh, these platforms, uh, we have three right now that we'll talk about. Uh, I think we'll talk about the first two tonight. The first is, uh, is UCSF Health. So as our delivery system, UCSF Health has resources to support and fund partnerships and innovation work. And uh, one program, as an example, I put up there is Caring Wisely where uh, the Med Center provides support to our faculty uh, to do specific research projects that improve healthcare value. 
And in exchange, we show that at the end of the one to two year period with those projects, uh, that they actually do reduce costs and improve our financial state. Um, and, and so uh, that becomes a really nice symbiotic relationship. Uh, we also have a program called the Inside Out Accelerator that Jessica will talk more about, um, which is uh, partnering with industry to fund our, inter our innovators inside UCSF, uh, mostly faculty on the campus side. Uh, but it's the industry who has uh, funding and dollars to, um, to promote or enhance a specific area, whether it's cancer care or heart disease or stroke care. Um, but they're willing to make investments uh, in, a, in an unrestricted way so that we have full intellectual freedom, academic freedom, to, um, to develop new ways to enhance care in their area that they care about. So they get to tell us what topic, but we then get to develop uh, the solutions. And so then the how, uh, as I mentioned, was we use a service design approach to solving problems. And we could do a whole hour on service design, so I've just distilled it on, onto one slide and, and we'll show you lots of examples. Uh, but the human-centered design and service design in particular have, have really been seeing a, a rapid rise in application in healthcare delivery. And if you look at the innovation centers that are popping up at other big medical centers, you find a lot of human-centered design uh, behind the curtain. Uh, and the way that uh, the key principles of the service design approach that we use is this double diamond model, uh, which, uh, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, first you need to make sure you're solving the right problem. And that involves really getting embedded and engaged in the environment and with the people that represent the problem you're trying to address. Uh, and only after that point do you then begin to uh, develop and define design principles that you can use to develop some prototypes and to see how they work and then get to a solution. So if you solve the right problem, then you're more likely to solve the problem right. Um, we do a lot of crowdsourcing here, which I think is a key part of innovation. Uh, and what we focus on in our innovation center are those four areas, um, devices, algorithms, service delivery, and digital applications. And that, for us, you know, to have a focus area, it's really care delivery and the, and the innovations that can be uh, uh, important there. It's not to say that innovating new biologics, new genetic testing, those are really amazing, and we have amazing people doing that, and we have other innovation centers that help with that. So in our, in our if you look at the pipeline of innovation development uh, and, and taking innovations to market, we're really on that distal end. In the, embedded in the care delivery system, helping things get to the final step. So I do want to show one example from one of the initiatives. This is actually the first initiative that we uh, participated in, which was a delirium reduction campaign at UCSF Health. Uh, and this is, we're now into our third year of that campaign. Um, the essential elements that allowed this to happen first was that there was a, a burning platform. So delirium is a huge problem in the hospital. It affects uh, 15 to 20% of all hospitalized patients in one form or another. And when patients get delirium, they have higher rates of falls, they have higher rates of, uh, of ulcers and, and other complications uh, of being in the hospital. Caudi is a catheter-associated UTI. Um, if you've ever uh, cared for or uh, had a family member in the hospital with delirium, it's, in, it's very distressful. They don't recognize you. They seem like they're on a drug hallucination trip sometimes. Uh, and it's uh, nursing and, and staff that have to manage patients with delirium ends up being taking up a lot of time, especially when we have four to one staffing ratios for nurses. Uh, even that uh, is not enough. Oftentimes you'll have one-on-one -on -one nursing with these patients uh, until things calm down. And it also increases length of stay. So from an economic perspective, we get paid for most patients from Medicare and most payers a, a, a relatively fixed amount for the care for the main reasons for that hospitalization. So that was developed because uh, hospitals in the old days were just keeping patients in the hospital for days and days because they got paid for every day they were in the hospital. And so finally the Medicare prospective payment reform in the 70s or 80s uh, realized that we're just gonna pay you a fixed fee for an appendectomy if you want to keep the patient in the hospital for 20 days, you can do that, but we're not going to pay you for every day. And so there's a whole you know, 
you know, organization that manages that. But the bottom line is that when people stay longer than expected or that's appropriate, that, that the hospital loses money on those patients. So the hospital's incentivized for us to try to get people to the right length of stay. Uh, too short of a length of stay, then they get readmitted and we get in trouble for that too. So it's really about finding the right, the right number there. The other essential element in our case was that we had local champions and experts. Um, so as an innovation center, we can't just walk in to, uh, you know, to a unit or to an area and sort of let them know that we're gonna help them fix their problems. You really need to have experts and champions inside that area uh, to have trust and, uh, and who actually really understand the subject area. And so that's always an essential item before we get started uh, on any uh, project. So Stephanie Rogers is a geriatrician here. Um, uh, she's a, a SME, is a subject matter expert. That's the, that's the acronym they use uh, in the innovation world. And she uh, and Vanya, uh, what we noticed at that, this was two and a half, three years ago, that there had already been an or, sort of organic uh, coming together of all these different groups of, of, of physicians and physical therapists and case managers and patient advocates, uh, sort of a volunteer army uh, that formed a task force to try to understand the delirium problem and what could we do to, to make things better. Um, and so when you see that happening, that, gr that, that, uh, that uh, ground up, you know, grassroots, you know, try to leverage and harness that. And so that's what we were thinking. Vanya Douglas is one of our neurology faculty members, and he's a researcher, and he had just completed validation of a screening tool uh, on the neurology service that identified patients at high risk for delirium. And, and so with the idea that, well, if we can identify these high-risk patients, at least we can pay extra attention. Let's review their medications, because that's one of the number one things that causes delirium. And let's see if there's a way that um, we can help reduce the impact of delirium on our unit if we can just identify the high-risk people. And their little pilot project that ran six months was positive. They, they had a reduction in length of stay. Uh, they didn't reduce the number of people getting delirium, but it seemed like they reduced the impact, uh, the severity of delirium in those people. And so what we did through my office uh, and the Clinical Innovation Center is we proposed to the medical center uh, a, a project that was asking for $100,000 to cover the time of our service designers, project managers, uh, mostly people time. We had a little bit of materials and support. And we estimated that if we could run this across the hospital, that we could see one to two million in savings by reducing length of stay. Uh, that was a complication or a result of the delirium. So that's how we got started and, uh, and we got funded. And so the next step was then to start the work. And, and what, you, what you have to do is start connecting the people and you need to start connecting to the system and understanding how does delirium get managed in the system and what are the constraints and barriers and, and facilitators that are gonna help you. Um, and so we had, our CRI, we had our Clinical Innovation Center Corps working on uh, some of the technical aspects of understanding the problem and, and beginning with some of that discovery uh, work uh, that I showed you in the double diamond model. Uh, but we also identified a lot of uh, other uh, key team members that, that worked on this project with us. Um, and so besides the internal uh, champions that I mentioned, uh, we also require data science and, um, and, and electronic medical record uh, expertise because that was gonna be the vehicle by which we did a lot of our, our work. Uh, these were the units we worked on. If, if you know Moffitt Long Hospital, so we began with the neurology service and neurosurgery service on eight, and, eight long and six long, and then hospital medicine, which was where Stephanie Rogers worked, which is 14 Moffitt Long and 15 long. But as I'm gonna show you, we quickly got talked out of doing a, a pilot by the president of the hospital and they asked us just plan on doing this system wide because uh, we're get, we, this is, you, we, we gotta commit to this in the long run. This isn't a one year project anymore. Um, the, on the front line, you had to work with nurses, physicians, pharmacists, PTOT, patient care assistants, volunteers, families. It's an incredible array of people whose perspectives and voice and input you need to bring together to understand the problem and understand how they can play a role in helping to mitigate and reduce the delirium impact. Um, and then of course we had leadership involved uh, and, and, and some other services. And then like I said, we also looked outside. So for this particular issue, which uh, 
uh, on the one hand, there was some engineering and operations uh, expertise we were looking for in terms of understanding uh, some of the environmental factors that contribute to the onset of delirium, like lighting and, um, and sleep and noise. Um, and so when Jessica went over to Berkeley, she found uh, the Berkeley uh, Industrial Engineering and Operations Research had a master's program and a PhD program, and these were students who were looking for projects to do during their semester. Uh, and the same with the Jacobs Institute, which is the design institute at Berkeley, also had these master's students who needed you know, something to apply the principles of what they were learning. And so we pitched the project, and we found a few that were willing to come over to San Francisco. Little did they know that commuting to San Francisco anytime between eight and five uh, turns into much more than a 30 minute commute. Um, so in fact, some of those teams came in at like five and six in the morning just so that they could round with the surgeons and things and, and they liked not having to wait, uh, deal with the traffic and other things. But, uh, but that, was, that was a great connection. And, and so this just shows the, the spread um, uh, that we ended up implementing and we stayed on track. We developed this at the beginning and I have to say the team stayed on track. The key principle show, being shown here is that we didn't design it once and turn it on everywhere. We designed it in one area, in neurology and then medicine, and each cycle we would learn about what worked, what didn't work, how do we make it better. Uh, and, but recognizing that just because it worked in pilot two in medicine, when it goes to cardiology, there's gonna be a whole new set of factors that didn't affect medicine, but affect cardiology. Um, and so, uh, so step by step, neurology, medicine, cardiology, general surgery, ortho, or neurospine, hematology, oncology, and finally transplant. And we were doing all this at Parnassus. The Mission Bay folks got kind of jealous and said, well, we want to be part of this. And we said, we'll share everything with you, but we don't really have enough staff to go over there. So Mission Bay just launched it on their own, and they've, they've been doing a great job. Um, um, and so this, uh, so this is an innovation talk. I, I could, there's a lot about the impact th that this program has had on delirium care, which has been great. But I want to emphasize what ha how did this become an engine for innovation? Um, and so uh, what happened was we developed a lot of tools to uh, make it easy for nurses, doctors, and staff to understand uh, how they were performing with regard to delirium care and delirium prevention. Because there were some screening tools that we implemented, there were some order sets and protocols that needed to be followed if people screened positive. And so we needed to keep those, those nurses and doctors engaged and give them some feedback on their performance. And so there were posters that every uh, week would go up in the nurses lounge that would show their performance for the morning shift and the evening shift to create a little competition. Um, and then on, on the great saves, that actually shows you the number of cases of delirium prevented based upon their baseline rates of delirium versus the new rates. Um, and and, and the, the technical aspect of this was that um, it had to get designed and developed within APEX, our, e our electronic medical record, so that it could spit it out every week. Um, and, um, and so that then becomes intellectual property. And, and all of this now is bundled into a toolkit that we can now uh, make available to other medical centers who might want to launch something like this without having to create it uh, from the ground up. And so we're talking with Deloitte, uh, who has, works with a lot of hospital systems. Another interesting thing that happened along the way was, you know, we have all these medical students looking for things to do in the summer. And so um, we found two medical students uh, who wanted to do something in data science and machine learning. And uh, if you haven't heard about data science and machine learning in this lecture or this series, I'd be surprised because that's really all the rage right now, predictive analytics. And so what they thought was, well, maybe there's a lot of effort and energy in training the nurses in how to do the screening, and then it has to be done reliably on every patient. And it just takes up time. There's a hundred other things that people are doing for in patient care. They thought that it's possible that with the data in the electronic medical record at the time of admission, that could they develop some machine learning algorithm to predict delirium risk? And could it be as good as a screening tool? Well, now we're measuring delirium in every patient, so we had a, a way to compare the machine learning tool to the nurse screen. Turned out the delirium screening tool, uh, the, the machine learning tool was much, much better than the screening instrument in part because the nurses are only asking four questions. Um, 
And so that's not their fault, but you have to make it feasible to do. And that would capture about 70 to 80% of the high-risk delirium patients. Their machine learning tool captured 90% of the high-risk uh, delirium patients. So now we're um, in the stage of loading that into the electronic medical record, letting it run in the background to see if it maintains that, that risk prediction property. And then hopefully that's something else we can, we can spread and use locally to help uh, improve care for these patients. Um, now in terms of the work that happened with Berkeley, um, it's amazing what people can do with $200 or $250, I think. That's how much they had to spend on whatever thing they were gonna develop for their class at the Jacobs Institute. And so one group came up with uh, something called Lumos. I'm gonna show you a clip on that in a second. That with smart ambient and light controller with ability for families to send videos and images into patient rooms. So the idea was how can we promote a, a more healthy healing environment and one that would reduce the risk of delirium when you're just, well, I don't wanna give away the video. The other one was a, uh, a motion sensor because we had no idea what kind of disruptions were happening, how much noise was going on uh, in each patient's room. Um, and so this was a light, sound, and motion detector that would allow us to measure those things continuously in every patient room to, under, to look at correlations and patterns to see how that might contribute. And so for each of these, they, used, they had a 3D printer at the Jacobs Institute, so they had to pay for the pellets that make the things, but they literally constructed a prototype that we could then test and use. You know, the, the little circuit boards and wires and all of that, $200. It was, it was, I was really amazed. So this is the, so at the end of their project, the students had to then take a little pitch deck back to their, um, back to their class to summarize what they, what they learned. This is Mimi, a hospital patient. And this is what the world looks like from his point of view. Pretty painful, huh? When Mimi is trying to sleep, Nurses come in at odd hours to check his vitals, often turning on bright white lights and disturbing his rest in the process. Because of disruptions within a foreign room, Mimi becomes disoriented about time and place and falls into delirium, a mental disturbance that is capable of doubling the length of his hospital stay. When Mimi isn't sleeping, he feels lonely because his friends and family are out of state, so his visitors are few and far between. Luckily for Mimi, there's Lumos, our team of UC Berkeley students, in partnership with UCSF Hospitals, created this smart lighting and ambient environment controller to lower delirium rates and combat patient loneliness and isolation. The controller consists of potentiometers, toggle switches, and push buttons wired to a Red Bear Duo and Raspberry Pi. All the electronics are housed in a 3D printed and laser cut enclosure. Patients and hospital staff can use the right-hand set of buttons to control the settings of a LIFX smart light bulb. Other Wi-Fi bulbs are also compatible. There are two different lighting modes. In manual mode, the bulb's color and brightness can be adjusted as desired. In day-night mode, Lumos emits bright blue light during sunlight hours and warmer, less disruptive light during the evenings to help regulate the patient's circadian rhythm and alleviate disorientation. For this setting, we programmed the color temperature and brightness in a 24-hour cycle based on the time of day and information from a cloud cover API. The left half of the Lumos controller interfaces with the projector and speakers. Postcard mode is a PHP-backed web portal that allows Mimi's remote friends and family to log on and upload images that will be displayed as a slideshow in his room. With postcard mode, Mimi feels less lonely and dejected. He feels connected to his loved ones and knows he's not alone. Using the Lumos controller, Mimi can also switch to environment mode to experience the sights and sounds of various ambient scenes. Tests conducted in a UCSF hospital room demonstrated that the projector can be displayed cleanly on a wall, but it can just as easily be adjusted to project on a ceiling or screen. In future iterations, the controller will have fewer wires and a more playful feel. This way, caregivers can immediately identify delirium based on how patients interact with it. With Lumos, patients like Mimi can feel at home in the hospital and experience a faster and more pleasant stay. Lumos, lighting your way to recovery.
So we're in the process now. We, so these students moved on. They said, well, I don't have time to keep doing this. You know, you, here's your box. <laughs> and so we're actually now looking to work with some engineers and other groups to take this to the, to the testing level and then uh, move on from there. Um, I think that's all I had. Uh, oh, the last slide. So just to show you some M the outcomes of this. So we're now two years in. And so these are the, the, the results from our, the end of, were presented in July at the end of our last fiscal year to show that, or actually it's year to date through April. So length of stay has gone down from a baseline of 11 days across all delirious patients to 10.3, um, which when you add up the numbers is quite a bit. Um, our case mex index, uh, which um, uh, has to do with the severity of illness. What happened was a, a lot of patients with delirium weren't even getting documentation of delirium. Um, and that, that adversely affects our, our risk adjustment models. I don't wanna to get too technical here, but um, so it's a good thing to see the CMI go up because that means we're getting credit for these sick patients now, whereas before uh, it looked like all of our patients were less sick than they were, and, and that, that affects reimbursement rates. Uh, and then you can see that our readmission rates also went down. And the savings uh, that uh, we budgeted into the budget that year of 450,000 uh, was beat uh, with an actual savings of 1.8 million for that year. Um, and so this is, this program's continuing. It's, it's now partnering with the volunteer services at the hospital because they can also help a lot with cognitive stimulation and, um, and it's really been worked into the operations. Uh, and that took two and a half to three years, but the, but the initial piece, those students were done in six months uh, in terms of how fast they turned stuff around. So. Um, it's fun to talk about the big wins. Uh, there, there definitely are not some that aren't so big. Um, so that's the end of my portion. Uh, I just want to bring you through one of our initiatives. Jessica is going to let you know about a couple other initiatives uh, as examples, uh, and then we'll, we should have plenty of time for questions too. So. Thanks, Ralph. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica, I'm director for the Clinical Innovation Center. Um, so a little bit of background about myself. I'm a pharmacist by training. Um, did my residency and MBA from Hopkins, um, and also started my own consumer health company, um, led product design for a couple more um, telehealth um, and, and a professional networking company. <laughs> um, joined UCSF a couple years ago um, to head up the Clinical Innovation Center. And one of the areas that I found um, working in the Bay Area is that there are tons of digital uh, companies out there, um, but not a lot of which really fix um, a complex healthcare problem that we see a lot in the health system, especially in the hospital setting. And so that's one of the reasons why I want to come back to the health system to, to learn more about the problem, to work with the people who are on the front line to solve it every day, um, and then to also see how we could increase their capacity um, to innovate. And so this is one of the program um, that I'm gonna introduce um, under the Caring Wisely um, Value Improvement Program. Um, so back pain, um, it's one of the, I think it's the third most common diagnosis for my primary care. Um, I think third to hypertension and lipid disorder. Um, in addition to that, this is also the um, primary um, referral um, volume that's driving a lot of the primary care referrals to specialists um, is back pain. And so because of this, um, we wanted to create an integrated spine service um, to support our patients and primary care providers in supporting and treatment of um, back pain. Um, current experience for back pain, it's, it's pretty hideous, if you could see here. Um, a lot of patients just don't know where they really need to go. Um, they get referred to many different places. Um, once they get to refer to one place, they get referred to another. Um, there are different types of specialists who um, root images and then they interpret differently and then they come back to primary care and they say different things. And so in a way, the journey to really understanding their back pain and understanding how do you um, cope with pain is very difficult uh, for a patient to really understand and, and treat really um, themselves. And so because of that, uh, we wanted to create a service that would align um, with the patient care as well as introducing um, spine specialists both from the physical therapy realm um, as well as from the orthopedics um, institute. And so this is um, an area that we're just starting, um, starting last year and we're continuing on this year. So 
before we, we dive into solutioning, um, one of the areas that we talked about is the double diamond model, right? Um, and so with the number, first part of the double diamond model is about discovery. And so for us is even though we think we know um, what our clinicians and frontline staff is thinking, we really don't know until we talk to them. And so that's the area that we um, have our service designer go to the front line um, and interview our stakeholders um, and also conduct focus groups so we could really get um, the feedback from the frontline staff of what they really view about not just the treatment and a diagnosis of back pain, um, but also the experience for the patients. Um, secondly, after we do a discovery phase, um, the second part is to define the problem a little bit better. And so as we collect a lot of these ideas, um, we create sort of this type of board so then we could curate common ideas and themes and synthesize um, the learnings that we have created, um, we have um, collected um, from the institution. And so with that, um, often we create something called design principles. So these are sort of guiding principles as we um, create the new service. Um, because the service will change, the processes will change, but the principle is not gonna change. So these are sort of our anchoring um, perspective that we take. And so um, for the integrated spine service uh, specifically, um, a couple items that we wanna highlight is um, the design principles of how um, patients and providers shift attitudes and beliefs about treatment effectiveness. Um, the second one is um, how can we provide seamless and coordinated care Third is providers are empathetic, trusted, and accessible. Um, fourth, um, treat the whole patient, and not just uh, from a perspective from a one specialist. Um, and then the last one is to set clear expectations. So those are all derived from us talking to the frontline providers, staff, as well as the patients. And so with that in mind, um, then we try to frame the solution. So we don't know what the solution is yet still, right? So we have design principles. Um, so the second part of it is how do we frame the solution? Um, so in our framing, I'm just gonna go through it quickly, is we want to create a platform of service and expertise. Um, potentially different way of how patients view pain. So go from, from different angle based on the perspective of the patient. Um, and also have a patient-centered interaction model. So really put the patients in the center of how we treat them. So um, the third part is prototyping. Um, and this is one that we create a service blueprint. Um, and so a blueprint actually helps us to understand what is it gonna look like, similar to um, how you build, develop a blueprint for um, like your home, for example. So these are based on the guiding principle. We created some type of workflow that we could then engage with different stakeholders and say like, hey, like, do you actually, um, this is what we're envisioning, does it sound good? Or we're starting with point A, um, we're gonna talk, to the, um, talk about the follow-up later, but does, it, does this seem right to you? So this is sort of our engagement point and anchor for us to talk to different stakeholders um, and also as we implement the new, um, new flow. And then in addition to that, um, because we know that patient is really at the center of this, is how do we create materials that we could engage with um, decision making between the providers um, and the patient. So we created various types of material for both understanding um, spine pain, um, as well as um, road to um, improve function and quality of life. Um, and there's also a website that I think is accessible to everyone, so if you go to, um, Call it, we call it ISS, so it's Integrated Spine Service, so iss.ucsf.edu, so you could take a look at some of the materials that we, um, that we have for the Integrated Spine Service. So right now, um, since we started, um, we have launched in Mission Bay um, campus for the Ortho Institute and our, our uh, physical therapy clinic. Um, we're gonna, we also moved into Mount Zion, um, and so upcoming for the next year, it's really, um, implementing it in women's health, China Basin, and then executive health. Um, and so that's our goal. Um, it's, it's a long road. Um, a lot of these we think that is, is simple, uh, it's not simple, um, especially with the many different types of players involved. Um, one of the areas, because this is a long sort of road, is how do we create process measures for us to understand what is going on um, if we don't have the end goal or the results right away? Um, one of the areas that we looked into is some of the process measures in terms of um, total referral. So as we turn on the service, are the primary care provider actually engaging with us? Um, and if not, why not, right? Um, the other ones um, 
target measures that we look into is um, the total number of visits that actualized um, from the referrals. And so for us is um, understanding uh, what our target is, which we set, um, and then also understanding uh, what's our total list. So these are our visits uh, from our integrated spine service. So it's a slowly, slowly <coughs> trending up. Um, the other measures that we definitely take a look at um, is our patients. So one of the areas that we uh, spend a lot of time in is understanding the psychological factors uh, for patients with back and neck pain. Um, a lot of those, um, these patients really um, needed behavioral therapist um, um, intervention. And so in our service, um, we found that a lot of our integrated spine service patients um, have severe um, psychological factors, which means that these are really the right patients to um, be provided um, these services. Um, the other one is that we looked at um, is a um, promise scores that we called um, to measure um, quality of life and physical and mental health. And so in our preliminary data that we found is that um, physical and mental health function have improved in a lot of our, all of our patients. Uh, and these are some of the measures that we continue to measure um, on a monthly or quarterly basis. So, um, and of course, so um, our patients, it's really the center of this. And so um, these takes a long time um, to be able to call the patients at the right time, um, to find the right interpreters, um, to really see like, how is this going for you? Um, and so these are some of the patient feedback that we've gotten um, in our initial phase. Um, one of the patients said, um, they're watching over me and even care about my emotional situation. Um, clinicians are very good at explaining things to me what I was told made sense, and I feel I'm getting more permanent diagnosis of my problem. I can already feel that my back is getting stronger. I had surgery, and the post-op exercises didn't help as much as the ones that I'm doing now. And so I think um, this speaks to the testament of our clinicians and our physical therapies really working uh, together um, for really improving the patient's quality of life. Okay, so um, the second platform that we have is something called the Insider Accelerator. So Ralph, intru Ralph introduced this um, earlier. So this is our involvement with um, introducing industry as a partner for us um, to, um, in a unrestricted way, for us to um, work with our faculty um, to create new um, ways to care for our patients. So in our first year, um, we got unrestricted grants uh, from Genetic, so the company, um, and to help our frontline providers um, better understand in the area of oncology, um, three different key areas. So one is cancer survivorship, patient navigation, and patient reported outcomes. So um, with that, um, we work with the Cancer Quality Committee um, to do a open proposal. So we crowdsource different ideas from our faculty. We're like, okay, so we have these fundings. Uh, faculty, give us your ideas within these areas and how we could fund you to create new things. And so with that in mind, um, we funded, um, we got about maybe 15 plus um, proposals and we funded three. And so today we're gonna go over two of them. The first one is something called Being Present 2.0. Um, this is through our work with Dr. Chloe Atria. So she's a GI oncologist. And so um, what she has done previously is that, um, so she understands that meditation as a um, program is not well designed for our um, cancer population. Um, what we found is that um, because cancer patients go through many different things, including caregivers, um, current meditation program doesn't really help with what they really need. Um, in addition to that, mindfulness program is very um, costly to them, so they have to go to someone to have that mindfulness program. And so for the caregivers as well as the patient, it's not something that they could really do in a viable manner. So how can we create meditation programs that are like clinically validated and also speak to specifically cancer stress and distress um, that they, um, both the patient and the caregiver might have? And so with that, um, the problem, um, like I said, and then so the innovation that we um, carved out is that how do we um, introduce a low-cost, disease-state specific mindfulness program that are directly um, that are directly introduced from the clinical environment compared to the conventional means. And so the unconventional features that we um, introduce are um, live, live online community sessions as well as program content with variation to support spectrum of patient and caregiver. 
Um, and so we design an eight-week program uh, for our patients um, to understand mindfulness as well as the caregiver. Um, and so for us, um, we really provided um, the service design component. So we did focus group with our patients. Um, we created with um, the faculty, and then we tested it through the first um, group of patients going through the eight-week mindfulness program. Um, and this is something that actually our team also experienced that so we actually went through the mindfulness program too. Because for me, I, I don't personally go through like meditation program, but this was one that was very interesting because it talks through cancer pain, uh, which is very different than traditional meditation program. Um, so as you see here on the far right um, is sort of the one pager of um, where patients and caregivers go to. So every day it says like, hello, Christopher, um, you're on week one um, and their meditation audio track, um, both in female and uh, male voices. Um, there's also longer track and also shorter tracks um, depending on what your preference is. Um, in addition to that, one uh, feedback that we got from the community is that they would like to have this um, support group. So we created webinar programs um, where they could sign on every week to discuss about what they learned through um, the eight-week journey and then share with each other, like, what did you find, what was most helpful for you, and how could I improve my mindfulness as we um, sort of go through this program together. Um, so the, um, the highlight is that um, our preliminary result is showing very high engagement at 90%, and also showing um, reduction in distress, fatigue, and anxiety, um, which is really great. Um, in addition to that, I think we're going to continue to complete the enrollment. So we actually just started enrollment a couple months ago. Um, we hope to publish the results um, and then to follow up um, study with expanded population. So. So the second one that I'm gonna introduce is something called a trial library. So this is one um, that we're starting, uh, we are working with Dr. Um, Hala Borno, um, who is a, G, um, a prostate cancer oncologist. So this was one where um, the problem is that a lot of clinical research um, doesn't um, really introduce, um, it's not fairly distributed among the um, various populations, especially the underserved. And we found and we know that um, their enrollment in clinical trial is actually very low. And it doesn't represent the, the normal distribution of our population in the US. So in this case, how do we in, improve sort of their access to clinical trial? Not just to that, but how do I improve the access to clinical trial in a way that is understandable, that is not complex, um, and that's something that they want to do. And so one of the sort of innovation that we introduced is how do we create not just a searching tool, um, which are, um, there are tons of searching tools out there, but how do we create a matching tool uh, to specifically guide them through a journey, help them navigate the complex clinical trial, um, and then to um, help them find the right trial uh, for these population. So um, going through the double diamond model again, so the uh, discover and define phase, we did a ton of focus group, um, especially um, in the prostate cancer population. So this is one where um, a lot of community sort of grassroots um, focus groups are formed. And so we actually um, tried to work with some of those communities to understand better the patient population. So with a lot of the research that we've done, the design principles that was derived is how do we create something that is designed for flexibility and accessibility? Um, how can we be transparent and honest, especially when patients talk about research and why am I being studied for um, something, right? Um, what are the side effects and what does it mean to me? Um, having a trustworthy uh, worthy voice is better than a legitimate one. Um, and facilitating a safe space. And so I think um, being able to create the trustworthiness and the safe environment is something that echoes through all of our research with our patients. Um, so in a couple months, uh, we, um, we developed the first prototype for the trial library. And one of the areas that we um, introduced is a lot of education component. So there are tons of education out there, um, but the way that we designed this is sort of more of a navigation tool and also to um, educate patients not just on what the clinical trial is, but also try to tackle some of the myths that are um, arising um, for that specific population. Um, so going through um, about clinical trial, what are the myths about cl clinical trial, how to enroll in clinical trials, um, why participate, 
um, and then through a matching tool. So um, these questions specifically, um, we have done also research with a focus group. Um, so then all of these questions are targeted to what they actually could tell us um, and in a language that is understandable to the patient population. Just quickly go going through them. And at the end of this is that we want to lead them to um, a couple of trials that are matched to their needs. And not only that, also introduce areas that um, they would like to see. So one of the um, um, highlight from the focus group is that I want to know what's my burden of coming to the trial, right? So how many times do I have to come in to see the patient, uh, to see the providers? How many blood draw I'm going to get? Um, how many rides if I, if, do I have to organize in order to get to the trial? So all of those are legitimate questions that often when you search for a trial that doesn't really provide for you. Um, and that's something that we actually work with our clinical um, research coordinator to provide. Um, so the next step for this is um, we are implementing it in a actual uh, pilot study. Um, and we also, um, and Dr. Uh, Borno also got additional funding, which is exciting, and grant to further develop this, um, not just in prostate cancer, um, but in uh, multiple diseases. Um, so that's really exciting to see. And that's the end of the presentation. Yeah, and so the question was, are we working with insurance companies like Anthem or Blue Shield? Um, yes, is the short answer. I think uh, where it's relevant to the business model for the innovation, if, especially if there's a relative advantage uh, where they would be a key stakeholder and someone who would be uh, a sponsor of something like this, uh, we do that. So I'm thinking of the ones that are up here right now that we showed you, I don't think any of those um, directly hinged on an insurance uh, partner. There is a program called e-consult and e-referral that we developed, uh, which was a way to help um, alleviate the overburdened long wait times to see our specialists by identifying uh, referrals that could be managed without the patient having to show up for an office visit, and then developing a platform to allow the information exchange so that it happens uh, easily. The reason that doesn't happen is because there's no reimbursement model for it. Um, and so we worked with our Hill physicians uh, when we designed the pilot to, to let them know we're putting this together, we're going to pay for it, our, our specialists are going to volunteer to do this, but we want you, Hill physicians, to track the number of endocrinology referrals, the endocrinology referral rate, which is one of the areas we worked on, and um, because we think it's going to go down. And uh, when it goes down, we, we want that as proof or, or evidence for you to start paying us for these. And that's exactly how it went. Um, and so now Anthem pays for them, the other insurance companies pay for them, and we just finished a big pilot, a national study with Medicare to, so that they'll start paying for them. So there are examples like that where um, the business model is so intertwined with, um, with the thing that you're innovating on that if, if, if you don't have that figured out at the same time uh, or have a plan for it, then it's not, it's just gonna die on the vine. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the question was, do we, uh, do we pick the innovation ourselves or do we always do more crowdsourcing and let the physicians innovate? It's really fun to let the physicians innovate and we're just all on for the ride and it's, uh, but we also have specific areas of expertise. Mine's in respiratory infections and, um, and flu and cough illness. Um, and so I was asked, that same question last night after a dinner meeting with some of our, uh, our innovation ventures group. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're gonna, we're, we've been, Jessica has been very patient with me because I've, I wanna do stuff on virtual care, uh, specifically in providing new ways for patients to get advice around cough and cold illness, uh, using new technology, emerging technology that we know can help provide an even better uh, answer as to whether you should come to the emergency room, urgent care, or we can manage you at home. Um, but it, it's, it's just slow and takes time. Um, are there other, would you respond to that any differently? I think in addition to that, um, I think the environment that we want to, um, enfor not enforce, but um, encourage is um, the collaborative environment where anyone to come to us um, with a problem. 
Um, and then a lot of times there's a lot of clinicians that have a lot of problems <laughs> they would like to um, solve together. And so that's a good journey to go together. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do have like senior leadership or even frontline staff or project manager coming to us and say like, hey, this seems like a big enough problem. Can you take a look at it further? And, and, we, do, um, and do, we do work with them for all of those um, um, type of sort of intake. Um, and that's always fun for us. And if we, if we could create a proposal around it and then create the funding and then drive it enough so that we could create the community to really solve the problem together. Yeah, so the question is, are we selling the Delirium uh, toolkit, uh, I want a better name than that, uh, <laughs> to other medical centers and how much are we charging for it? So uh, we do want to license uh, in part just to, you know, to get some return on investment in terms of the work we put into it, but also to recognize that we're in a marketplace and that we have other things we can do with revenue to support more programs and projects. And, so it's kind of trite the no money, no mission, but, um, but yeah, we need to maintain a certain margin and, um, you know, and some modest revenue from this that as a win-win for everybody is how we're looking at it. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna, do you have any ideas? Because you've been talking to Deloitte. <laughs> um, so there are two problems. So one of them is um, we want to disseminate the knowledge. And so within our Delirium initiative, we were able to publish a lot of um, our insights. Um, we went to a lot of national um, conferences to share what we have learned. So all of those are definitely free and up for grabs and to learn. Um, and I think the toolkit is specifically of if you want to implement a, a pathway um, and you really need to understand how to integrate with the EMR, for example, um, understand all the educational tools and how they fit with each other and how do you monitor. So in that case, then that will take us effort to help you. Um, so in return, then we would like to see, like, can you actually support our effort as well? So that's the intent of the sort of licensing out. Um, I think in terms of talking with like Deloitte or disseminating to um, potential other companies who might want to use it for profit reason, um, that's the area that we want to license out because that's something that we spend a lot of times in, in creating our intellectual property. So in that case, if you intend to sort of make profit out of it, then, um, then it makes sense that the university would want to charge for that. <laughs> 